Welcome, everybody. Hope you can hear me all right. Great to see uh, a nice, energetic audience. Lots of youth in the crowd, too, which is good always. So we're really uh, pleased tonight to uh, welcome you to the UCI School of Medicine Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm Dr. Michael Stamus, Dean of the School of Medicine here at UCI, and your host for tonight's event. Our Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series is designed to bring together influential leaders from healthcare and academia to share their insights, their experience, and anecdotal stories with our faculty, staff, students, and community members. The program features a series of three speakers per year, one representing innovation in basic sciences, one representing advances in clinical medicine, and one speaking on developments in clinical research. And those are chosen uh, by the three vice deans of those three areas, along with my subtle input. <laughs> I'm honored uh, that you joined us tonight's event to hear from one of the most influential leaders in healthcare, Dr. Rick Barone. And Rick honestly could have spoken on any three of those broad topics, but, but he is actually Dr. Daniela Bodas' uh, invited guest, and she'll have a chance to tell you a few more words uh, about Rick in a minute. Uh, but we're delighted to have him here to talk really on a topic, uh, at least uh, for tomorrow, assigned to on clinical research. But today, he's going to talk about uh, something a little more perhaps interesting to a, uh, to a broader audience. Uh, he really is an expert in uh, neurologic and neuromuscular diseases such as ALS and muscular dystrophy. But tonight he's gonna talk to us about what they never taught you in school about healthcare career pathways. And there are some handouts around the room if you wanna uh, take notes or just keep those for future uh, perusal. Rick is uh, Missouri University's top health administrator, the executive vice chancellor for health affairs and the Executive Scientific Director of the Next Gen Precision Health Institute. Before I go too far in introducing him, I want to introduce Dr. Daniela Boda, our Vice Dean for Clinical Science Research, Director of the UCI Alpha Stem Cell Clinic, and Professor of Neurology, not to mention an impressive clinical researcher in her own right, who has all the details to share with you, Dr. Boda. Thank you all for being here for a very exciting lecture. We are very impressed with everybody wanting to learn about the experience that Dr. Barron brings to the academic community and especially to our careers in medicine. I know that you have heard already about much of his academic accolades. I will just mention that he is the Dean and Executive Vice Chancellor of University of Missouri Healthcare System. And this is 23 departments. One of the oldest schools, I just learned that it's 150 year old. And he is involved in multiple initiatives, including precision medicine and precision health. I think it's also important to remember that Dr. Byrne is an exceptional neurologist. He has focused in the care of the patients with very significant and complex disorder, including ALS and muscular dystrophy. He did graduate from University of Missouri, Kansas City, and then he completed his residency at the Wolfer Hall Air Force Medical Center and a fellowship in neuromuscular diseases at Ohio State. He has completed over 100 clinical trials, published more than 350 peer review articles, and continued to lead basic patient-centered clinical and population health research. He was funded by the NIH, the National Institute for Advancing Translational Science, and he also has held the Neuronext grant at KU Medical Center. He has always prioritized the research in the field of neuroscience, but also influenced research in cancer, cardiovascular metabolic infectious diseases, child health, and other emerging areas that disproportionately affect the population of his state. But furthermore, he has created numerous generations of medical students, residents, fellows, and mentors, and continues to mentor junior, mid-level, and occasional senior faculty. <laughs> so without further ado, it's our true pleasure to have Dr. Barron here. Wow. Dean Stamos, Daniela Bota, thank you so much. What a 
What a great, great pleasure to be here. Uh, meeting new people, having high school students here, having, where's my Tiger Med students? Tiger Med students here that came. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, so, and my neuromuscular colleagues, uh, Dr. Annabelle Wong and Dr. Namita Goyle, and who I've known for many years. It's, it's really just such a treat to be here. Uh, I know what an honor it is to have been selected to come here to speak to you all um, tonight and then again tomorrow. So when I was asked uh, to, to come and to, and to give two talks, and, uh, and one was a, a clinical research talk, that's tomorrow, and the other one was a more general talk about, about uh, that I decided to talk about career advice. So I sent in two names to the committee or, or to your office. I said, well, I think the first talk I want to do career advice for, for healthcare professionals, and the second talk I want to do um, talk about uh, investigating initiated clinical trials. And I got an email back saying, those titles aren't fancy enough, Dr. Barron. You gotta, you gotta snazz them up so we can get people in the room. So I changed the title for this talk to uh, uh, the, what they never taught you in, in school about healthcare career. And the one tomorrow, I changed the title to how to do an investigator initiated multi-center federally funded clinical trial for under $1,000 a day. And so I sent those two titles in, and I never heard anything back. So I guess, I guess I'm good. All right, so uh, this should be a talk that's interesting to high school students, my medical students, uh, and, and uh, maybe to some of the senior leaders in, in the audience as well. But these are some of the takeaway messages that I think I've learned in my uh, career in academic medicine. So let's, uh, my goals in, for, for today's talk are to discuss what I think are research pathways uh, in, in a university setting, and to discuss the stages in, your, in a research career, to discuss some of the barriers and the essential components on how to be successful, and at the end, to talk a little bit about motivations. You know, why are we doing this? Why did you all come out tonight anyway to hear Dr. Barron talk about career advice? Uh, and I did publish some of this once in a, in a fairly obscure uh, uh, publication out of University of Kansas, which they have a, once a year they put a, there's a think tank that, that meets about how are we doing in research at Midwest universities. So there's this Merrill series on research, uh, uh, and, and so some of the stuff you can find in there. All right, so this scary slide is um, in the handout I gave you, some of you have, and it's the first slide. And if I just talked about this slide for the next 15, 20 minutes, we're done. This is really the most important thing that they never teach you when you're a high school student thinking about going into medicine, when you're an undergraduate thinking about going into medicine, when you're in medical school, they never teach you this. When you're a resident, they never teach you this. So I'm gonna teach it to you now. So, all right, so you've, you've made the decision, you've, got into med you've decided to go to medical school, you've got in medical school, you do your four years, you decide what you wanna do, with it, what specialty you wanna go into, you, and then you do that, and then you get into a fellowship, everyone does fellowship these days, and so now you're done. Now what? Now what do you do? So what are the options that you, as a newly minted MD or DO that's done uh, uh, residency and fellowship training have. And so these, I think, are your options. So the, the, the first option is, uh, so I can hover. Oh, look at that, that's really cute, okay. So, but if you have a tremor, it really shows. I do not have a tremor, so okay, there we go. So, all right, so non-academic practice or academic practice. So the first thing is, do you want to work in a university academic setting or out, or in a non-university academic setting. And if you decide you wanna work in the non-academic setting, then you can work either for a health system or you can go into traditional private practice, either solo or with a, with a group. So healthcare systems, do the high school students know what a healthcare system is? Kaiser, HCA, uh, or, or, and, or there's a lot of nonprofit uh, healthcare systems, I'm sure there are in this town. 
uh, and uh, where there isn't an academic focus, it, uh, in some healthcare systems, uh, you actually can do uh, research if you want to. Like Kaiser's uh, got a pretty uh, uh, fluid way, so you can still continue to do some clinical research, um, and you have to negotiate that when you, when you get hired. Um, uh, but, but some healthcare systems really frown on, on, on research time because it takes away your ability to see patients and generate money for the healthcare system. Then you can go into private practice either on your own or in a group of, of like-minded physicians. And in private practice, you actually can do all the research you want because you're paying your own salary. Um, and so there, some of my friends have been amazingly successful in, in having very active clinical trials research careers in private practice. Uh, uh, Dr. Goyle and I know some in Houston who spend 50, 60% of their time doing clinical trials and, uh, and they are able to generate income from that as well. So, uh, so you can. Now let's say you decide you don't want to go into a non-academic practice. You've spent all your you spent the last eight years in undergrad, medical, and then residency and fellowship on top of that, so really it's 12 years, and uh, you decide you wanna stay in a university setting. So when you, when you get a job at, at UC Irvine or uh, University of Missouri Columbia, you have a couple options, and they are right here in this, in this uh, pathway. So one option you have is you can just be a clinical doctor and spend all your time seeing patients, just like you would at a healthcare system or in private practice. And you don't really have to do research and education. You can just see patients. And doctors, Dean Stamos and I love those doctors because they're the ones that fuel the, the engine to make a, a healthcare system full of patients that want to come to your healthcare system. And so, uh, and and so off, in modern academic health centers, these are often the majority of our doctors, to be quite honest. But no, people don't realize that uh, when they're thinking about jobs in academic health care. All right, so you can be a f pretty much a full-time clinical doctor. You may have medical students every now and then or uh, a resident uh, re in your clinic or in the OR with you, but most of the time you're seeing patients. So let's say you do want to spend some time during, doing research. So that's this pathway here. So you can, uh, you can come down here clinical uh, with clinical translational research. And I put clinical translational research because while you could go to med school and after that spend all your time doing basic preclinical research that has no translational ability, that's unusual. I mean, most, most research that you're gonna do after med school usually does translate into some health or disease process. Um, you don't have to, but that, that's the way this is set up. So then when you do, when you're uh, with, uh, you're doing, gonna do clinical or translational research, then you have three options in my universe of this. You can spend most of your time in a wet lab doing uh, wet lab research. Um, and, and I call it NIH focus pathway. Or if you're gonna do dry lab research where you're not playing with test tubes and petri dishes, but you're, you're actually doing either clinical trials or outcomes research um, uh, or natural history research. Um, there's two pathways there. One is to focus, again, on getting an NIH grant. And, uh, uh, and, and the other is to, um, uh, and that's this pathway here, and the other is to spend more of your time seeing patients but still having a research focus in your career pathway. So these two pathways here, this wet lab research with the early NIH focus and this pathway here, uh, dry lab clinical translation research with the early NIH focus, I'm gonna talk more about that in the next slide. These are folks that come out of fellowship and they are absolutely committed to getting an NIH grant of some sort or, the, or equivalent. And so they need time to be successful. Um, and they're not gonna be seeing a lot of patients right out of the box. Um, these folks here, which is actually probably the majority of researchers at an academic health center, they're predominantly seeing uh, patients, but they are having some focus on research. So I call these 80 to 90% clinical and 10 to 20% research. 
So this is what I was when I first started. And sometimes sort of magic happens and you can, if you all of a sudden get really successful in getting research grants, uh, then you can switch actually and become more research focused. Um, the, um, there are a few other pathways that you can do when you finish, uh, when you finish your uh, residency and fellowship. Um, you can be a federal doctor. Um, I did that for a while actually. I was in the Air Force for a number of years. Um, you can work for the military or the public health system. You can be a VA doctor. And actually that's a whole other pathway um, because there's a lot of options you can do in the VA. And then at the bottom, someone asked me last night when I told him I was gonna show this, uh, what about uh, entrepreneurship? And we are in an entrepreneurship building here. That's what this building is all about. You know, at any time you can exit this uh, and, and actually have a career in industry. You can either work for a big industry company, big pharma or big device company, or you can start your own company. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the talk. So um, I really do believe that this is the stuff that all undergrads thinking about medical school, uh, folks that get in medical school, get this sort of message early on so they can start framing, what is it that I wanna do after I finish my training? And so I'm, I don't have time to go over it, but, but in the handout, um, I've done the same thing and I've created these pathways for uh, PhDs, which is actually a little more complicated. There's more, there's more pathways. I've got it for RNs. I know, we, Bree, we have one RN in the crowd. Here's your, this is your pathway. Um, and then I've actually done it for um, allied health, PT, OT, ST, and RT. And then for research coordinators. There's a research coordinator pathway that you'd like to see. So I'll let you uh, study that on your own. You can email me if you have questions. So this, I think, is the, is the main message of my talk. Um, just a couple things for the, uh, for, I don't know if we have any really junior, any residents or junior faculty here. So we have a lot of senior level administrators here. So this is what I like to te uh, remind uh, folks that are thinking about going into academics or, or when residents are interviewing for a job our fellows are interviewing for a job and they say, Dr. Barron, I wanna do research. Well, what does that really mean? And so, uh, and you're trying to set them up for their first package, their startup package. So if they are gonna do wet or dry lab research that's, uh, that's uh, and they're gonna be NIH focused, then at least in my university, and this isn't the same around the country, it really depends, we put them on the tenure track and they do get a startup package um, and they get massive protected time. So this is where the deans have to step in, the department chairs have to step in, and for two to three years, these faculty have significant protected time so they can be successful getting their K awards or, or and subsequent uh, NIH grants. Um, if they're on the clinical scholar track, which is like the 80-20 track, um, usually there, at some places there are, but in my in, in my shops where I've worked, I haven't done startup packages for those. Having said that, I can remember when I got my first academic job, I asked for a startup package. My chair was really nice to me and I would, he bought me a new EMG machine. Okay, so it wasn't that expensive. Um, and I think that's what I got. Um, but uh, you're, you're basically um, uh, get, a, most of your time you're doing, you're doing clinic, you can maybe negotiate up to a day a week to do other activity. Um, and then the goal is, we talked about this last night uh, at dinner, is as you get more successful getting either pharma trials or, or, or being on your friend's NIH trials, you can buy yourself out of clinic time and, and, and do more and more research. Um, if you're on the clinical track, we love you. We want you to see a lot of patients, no startup, no protected time and you're probably not gonna do any research. Every now and then you'll get someone that participates a little bit um, to help enroll patients, but, but by, by and large, not. All right, so um, this is the, the cartoon on, on the front of the handout I gave you. This next table is really scary. And the reason I gave it as a handout is for those people that wanna study it later. So I started making this over a decade ago, and it's what I think you should be doing at the various phases, pretty much by decade, 
of your academic career if you decide to take the plunge and actually do academic medicine with research. So um, maybe I should have started this uh, a little earlier. Um, high school students get involved now, um, and all of you are involved in doing research projects. So this, I, I, I need to revise this table, but this table really starts for if you're a um, professional student, healthcare profession student, or a doctoral, PhD doctoral candidate, or a resident, or a fellow, or even a PhD postdoc. Um, so in that phase, uh, what are you going to be doing? Um, if you're a, a physician, you're gonna be writing case reports, case series. Um, you're gonna be, if you're a PhD student, you're gonna be publishing your student lab research with your mentor, uh, getting the work out from your dissertation. And this is really not the time where you're gonna be focusing on grant funding, you're focusing on graduating. Um, but you do have the opportunity to get your name out there. Um, in, the next, in the next decade, um, where you have your first academic job and you're assistant professor, um, I think this is the time where you are just writing, writing, writing. You're writing as much as you can, and, and um, you're uh, getting your name out there uh, through your publication so that people know that you're an expert in X disease. Um, and so you start getting invited in pharmaceutical trials, uh, and you start getting invited in other people's NIH trials. Um, and, you get, and you're successful at that, and you can put in RO3s and R21s and get career development grants, K awards, and VA career development grants. So the next phase, you've made it through that phase, and now you're in your probably 40s, uh, mid 40s, and um, uh, you, this is probably about the age where people start getting their first R01, interestingly, maybe slightly before that. Um, but you're uh, going to be, uh, if you're doing clinical translational research and at trials, uh, like I do and Dr. Bota does and other people in the room, um, you are, uh, you're designing some of your first investigator-initiated trials. It could be just at your site. It could be at a couple different sites. So there's small pilot studies. And again, you're being asked to be in other people's larger IITs. Um, you start mentoring students, and you're probably starting to train fellows at this point. Um, and uh, then you move on to the next decade, and you've been successful at your small pilot studies, and you sort of figured out what to do, and you start submitting your first multi-center uh, uh, investigator initiated trials, which are, uh, I'm going to talk about several of those tomorrow in, in my scientific talk. You really start doing a lot of international networking. Um, you are uh, trying to get your, your articles in high impact publications. Um, so uh, then I, uh, I move on to the next phase of the career. So uh, you, uh, in, in your mid, 50s, I think you're starting to be a leader in large consortiums. Uh, you may be putting in program projects. You may be writing a CTSA grant and being the PI on that. Um, you, you need to stop writing abstracts and stop applying for pilot grants. It really bugs me when I see these full professors putting in pilot grant uh, applications. Uh, this is for the, pre, the, 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 the younger folks. Um, and, uh, you, but you do want your junior people to write abstracts, so you're helping them do that. Uh, you may lead a study section at this point, uh, and you start raising money. Actually, I put that in the late 40s, early 50s. You start doing philanthropy, because you do need that source of income to fuel the research initiative. Um, late 50s and 60s, um, here I start getting a little tongue in cheek. Um, um, start a website, because that's what I did. Um, start leading organizations, and, um, uh, and, I, and I started a journal uh, at this phase. I'll, t I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, this is controversial. Um, once you're sort of at this level and you've, uh, you've been, I said, ex-chair, distinguished professor, um, I, I actually stop reviewing, except for my journal. <laughs> Um, just there's just so much time but this, uh, that, that you have to donate. Um, and, uh, and then finally, I'm in this bottom bracket, uh, late 60s uh, and, and 70s. I won't tell you exactly where I fit there, but I'm somewhere in that broad range. Um, and uh, uh, what, I'm, what am I doing? Well, I'm uh, continuing to raise money, continue to uh, try to get junior people, 
build the infrastructure so that the junior people coming up can be successful in this. And, uh, and then in my situation, I'm executive vice chancellor for health affairs. Um, and I put after that, retire, be emeritus or not. And it turns out, if you saw on my uh, opening slide, my title, um, I actually retired from the University of Kansas as a distinguished professor, and then I got rehired by the University of Missouri. So there's all sorts of fun things you can do late in your career. All right, so this is the website that I started. Some of the neuromuscular docs in the audience know about this. I actually don't do play with it much anymore, but it's got several thousand neuromuscular docs around the country that go in and talk about cases. The student, the high school students and the medical students may wanna check this out. All right. So now I'm going to get back to uh, the research discovery process. What are the essentials and what are the barriers? Oh, we need to go back. All right, can you run this tape? This is one of my favorite clips from Shakespeare in Love, and this talks about the idea process. Give me the drink, man, Dragora. Straight up, Will. Give my friend a beaker of your best brandy. Shakespeare's got writer's block. Kit. He can't think of his next How goes play it, well? he wants to write. Wonderful, wonderful. Burbage says you have a play. I have. And the chinks to show for it. And that's and sis, the, the beaker for Mr. Marlowe. I hear you have a new play for the curtain. Not new. My Dr. Faustus. Oh, I love your early work. Is this the face that launched a thousand ships and burnt the topless towers of Ilium? I have a new one nearly finished and better. The Massacre at Paris. Good title. Mm. Yours? Romeo and Ethel, the pirate's daughter. Bad idea. <sighs> yes, I know, I know. What is the story? Well, there's this pirate. In truth, I've not written a word. Romeo. Romeo is Italian, always in and out of love. Yes, that's good, until he meets. Ethel. Do you think? The daughter of his enemy. The daughter of his enemy. His best friend is killed in a duel by Ethel's brother, or something. His name is Mercutio. Mercutio. Good name. Will, they're waiting for you. Yes, I'm coming. Good luck with yours, kid. I thought your play was for Burbage. This is a different one. A different one you haven't written? Was this the face? Anyway, that's, uh, I love that clip uh, because everyone thinks Shakespeare in Love is about love. There's a little bit of love, but there's several themes in Shakespeare in Love. As one is the, a generation of the original idea. So when you do your research project, it may be your idea. It may be one of your colleagues' idea. And I've, uh, in some of the projects I'm gonna go through tomorrow, uh, several of them were not my original ideas, but we put the team together and we ran with it. So that's, uh, so that's it starts with an idea. And this uh, is just a summary of what I think are the essentials that you need in order to do clinical and translational research. You, someone's got to come up with the idea. So it may be one of you, uh, high school students or, or medical students, uh, but someone has to come with the idea. You have to have some interest or desire. You do have to have some talent, not as much as you'd think, but you do have to be persistent and get trained well. You have to have training, and Dr. Boda and her team are all over trying to get our young doctors trained up to do clinical research. You have to have some time to do it, and depending on how research intensive you are depends how much time you need. Um, you have to have mentorship. You have to have a team. You can't do anything in isolation now and the next clip I'm gonna show you is an example of that. You need a place to do it, you need space. This is a research space. This is a space for entrepreneurship research, um, uh, but UC Irvine's full of space now, infrastructure space, in order to be successful in your, in your research projects. You gotta have money, you can't do it without money. And then, if you're gonna do clinical research, you need to have subjects uh, for your clinical trials. So, this is my next clip from Shakespeare in Love. So now they're, 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 they're men are returned to the house. This is the team. Can't do the research without the team. Henslow. Who is this? 
Silence, you dog! I am Hieronimo. I am Tamberley. I am Faustus. I am Barabbas. The Jew of yeah. Malta. Oh, yes, Master Will. I am Henry the Sixth. What is the play and what is my part? Uh, one moment, sir. Who are you? I'm, um, I'm the money. <laughs> I love that. So that's your grant agency right there. All right, so you, you got to hit. Oh, Huzzah! Move on here. All right. So you got to get the money. And um, there's all sorts of ways to find the money to get your research off the ground when you're junior. And this is a, a slide summarizing that. I'm not going to go to, through them in detail. I know this is being recorded and the slides are available. But there's a lot of different ways you can find money to get your research off the ground. Some of it's in your startup package. Some of it's in uh, uh, local pilot grant funding. But a lot of it is through uh, foundations, uh, federal grants, um, uh, and, uh, and, and, you and you need to find a pot of money to get started. All right, so I can't, I can't believe I have high school students here. This is perfect. So um, I'm a big baseball fan. Uh, went to a lot of Royals games when they were on their winning streaks in the, uh, about seven, year, seven years ago. And uh, I, so I made this sort of baseball analogy. So you do have a number of at-bats in order to get your research off the ground. Um, so I call them minor league. Not being disparaging, but you know it's your first, your first starting. So high school. So you guys are all doing high school projects. So you're 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 actually up taking a swing in high school. That is huge. It's it's. I never did that in high school. Um, and so then you get another shot when you're an undergrad. Did you guys do any research back there? Yeah. See that that's how they got in med school. So they all did research as undergrads, and then you get another shot doing it in medical school or if you're PhD in, in, in grad school, getting your PhD degree. All right, so that's minor league. Spring training. I call spring training, okay, now you're, you're graduated med school, or you got your PhD, and so you're a resident and a fellow. And you can, you can have some swings at, at the research bat when you're in your residency and fellowship. Uh, and then finally, you're in the big leagues. So you got your, your first assistant professor job, junior faculty, um, then mid-level, then senior, like I showed in there. And so you, you really have three swings at the bat. Now, you don't have to uh, participate uh, in research in minor leagues. You don't really have to do it in spring training either, but it makes it more difficult if you start in the big leagues and try to be successful. So if you, you know, you basically have three, three swings. If, if you have three strikes, then you're out, you're done. So that's fine. If research wasn't for you, you can go back to the clinical tract, and, 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 that, and that's good. But if you do, uh, are successful at any of these levels, uh, then, that's my avatar, by the way, then you can get a home run. All right. So um, I just put this slide in uh, yesterday because I, I was trying to cut down the number of slides, and I heard there were going to be some young people here and some lay people. And so... Uh, I like showing this. So what do all of these folks have in common? I've already talked about Shakespeare, Patrick Mahomes. Oh, my gosh. So, uh, but, you know, John Lennon, Joyce DiDonato, who's from Kansas, Overland Park, Kansas. Um, and then what do these folks have in common? The front line, Ringo Starr, the cello, the, the, the cello uh, pieces in the symphony, or the... Or the um, the, uh, the, the ballerina troupe, not the prima ballerina, but the troupe or the chorus. So basically, when you're gonna do team research, you do have to have roles for everyone. So some people are going to be the PIs that are running the, running the shop with, uh, with their uh, administrative team, but you need a lot of team players as well. Uh, we, need a, we need research coordinators, uh, we need technicians, um, we need other clinicians that are going to enroll, help us enroll patients for a large, a large study. And so, and your roles can change over time. Sometime in a study, you'll be, you'll be uh, 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 one of the leaders, and another time, you're you're going to be a role player. And and I've I've enjoyed going back and forth in those roles over my career. All right, so uh, I was. Uh, talking to our associate dean for. 
uh, physician development. Where is he, Dr. Gunshin? There you are, today. And I said I was going to talk about this a little bit. Um, great, great dean job too. I we don't. I need to may have one of those at my school. So, um, so, Dr. Boda, this is not a slight to you. You're you're an MD PhD. You do that amazing work, and some MD PhDs do phenomenal. Um, but there is a big dropout rate on MD PhDs that actually uh, so that that actually spent all this time usually in the wet lab doing research after their first two years of medical school, if they decide to go the MD PhD route, then they spend three to four years in a wet lab, then they go back to the clinic and then they do the residency. And many of them are unlike Dr. Bota, they never go back and pick up their research career. So, so sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So there are other pathways that you can, you can think about. So I know one of the things that we're doing at, at our school now is we have an umbrella PhD program that is, um, that is either for wet lab research or dry lab research. Um, and and we, we we're uh, in, in, in our MD PhD slots, um, uh, we, we want at least 50% of them to be in dry lab research. I just feel that if they have the opportunity to do non wet lab research and get their PhD, there may be a higher likelihood that they're going to continue with their research career. I don't know if that's true actually, but I think that might be. Um, so uh, the other option that we're uh, to try to convince people to stay into research is to take a year off between the uh, second and third year of medical school, sometimes between the third and fourth, but usually between the second and third, and take a year off to do clinical research and get a master's of science in clinical research. And I think you have that type of program here. And, and that's become very popular in the last, uh, in the last decade. So that's the U.S. How did the Brits do it? So they actually have a six-year med school right out of high school. And they don't even get an MD. They get an MBBS or MBCHB. Uh, I got this from Mike Hanna, Namita. He gave me the abbreviations. I'm not sure what the difference is. Um, and so then they're a physician at the end of six years. But those docs aren't doing research. Um, they, they, they do the residency. They're, uh, they're equivalent of residencies. And then they're out seeing patients. So if they want to get an MD, they've got to do another three years and, and, and do research. Or now there's, I've been told in England it's switching, so they're not even getting the MD, they're just going right to the PhD. Um, and so that's how the British do it. So I've been thinking in the US, maybe we should have different tracks. Maybe we should have a more practical clinical doctorate track that you can do in six years. Um, and then if you want to go on and actually have a research intensive career, then it's eight years, and you could probably squeeze an MSCR in there too, because you really don't need eight years to get through undergrad and med school. Um, and so, uh, and those and those folks may be more likely to do research. So th these are just sort of uh, ideas I've been thinking about. And why do I think maybe it's possible to do this? Because I was the most unlikely research prospect. I went to a six-year medical school, UMKC, University of Missouri, Kansas City, Go Kangaroos. There's only um, a handful of six-year medical schools in the United States, but the rest of the world, uh, in, in Europe and in England, it's, it is six years. Um, so I went through this six-year program. I didn't even have a BS. I had a BA in biology and an MD. And then I joined the Air Force. You know, what was that about? But it was great. I had a great time in the Air Force, and I got all my, most of my training in the Air Force. I did do my fellowship at The Ohio State, um, and that's where I really got the academic bug, pretty much. Um, but this is what med students looked like in the 70s, sort of like what you look like now. So it's very, very close, it's going retro. <laughs> All right, so when did I become an academic researcher? Um, so at UMKC, I did a little bit of, a, a, I had a very minor amount of research curiosity, but I did do a little bit, and I took physiologic psychology, did some research. Then uh, when I was, uh, Near the end of med school, I had to do an Air Force time in San Antonio, and I did neurosurgery because I was thinking about doing neuroscience. And I had this great neurosurgeon who was trained at Tufts. He was giving military time back. And we saw a baby that was born with this weird deformed bump on its head and did it, biopsied it, had something called cranial fasciitis. And he said, Rick, we're going to write this paper up. So I went over to his house, 
It was a, a, on a weekend typewriter. Pulled out his typewriter, because this was back in uh, 1978, and I wrote my first paper with him. Um, and that's how it started. Um, then uh, through the military, um, as a neurology resident in the military, the, uh, I don't know if they had this in, in, your, brand, in your area, Dean Stamos, but the neurology uh, programs in all three services had annual meetings that we went to. And so as a resident, every year, I would actually uh, present at this annual neurology meeting somewhere around the country, either in San Francisco or DC, um, uh, usually. And I actually enjoyed presenting at that little uh, research meeting. Um, the Air Force uh, uh, paid my way to go to Ohio State, and that's what really turned uh, my focus onto research. And I got in with an unbelievable mentorship team, put me on some projects. Uh, I came up with research criteria, clinical and research criteria for a weird neuropathy called chronic inflammatory demyelinating neuropathy. Um, my mentors hooked me up with mentors in New York and in San Francisco, and I wrote some early case series of, of a weird autosomal recessive muscular dystrophy. And, um, and I, I really got the research bug in, in fellowship. Um, then I went to, after I got out of the Air Force on active duty, I went to University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, spent a few years there as an assistant, uh, went to UT Southwestern as, as an associate, and was part, in a, in, at that point, I was now a little fish in a big pond, at, uh, at, a, at, a, at a major academic research center and was able to help build a big neuromuscular division, was acting chair there for a couple years, then went to KU uh, and was the department chair and, um, and, and, and that's when Dr. Bota was my, neuro was my neurology resident. Um, and so that's, that's how I got into research. Um, this is probably a little too weedy, but uh, uh, Annabelle and Namita, you'll, you'll appreciate this. Uh, so during my fellowship, I got really lucky, uh, and uh, with my mentor, I ended up seeing a boy uh, with, um, with, a, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy who had acute gastric dilatation syndrome. And, um, and so he said, Rick, you should look at this in a group of Duchenne boys. So this is my first prospective, natural, uh, prospective study where we got consent did gastric emptying on Duchenne boys and controls and showed that these Duchenne boys had delayed gastric emptying. And it was the same year that the dystrophin gene was, di was discovered. And, um, and, and my mentor said, you know, I bet we can get this New England Journal of Medicine and speculate that it has to do with dystrophin in the gut. And he was right. So, um, so that was what really one of my first papers. Um, so I just got lucky. And then I, Continued to work with my mentors uh, early in my career. Uh, here are several of them in this picture that uh, uh, Namita and Annabelle know. And, uh, and uh, based on the work I did as a fellow coming up with diagnostic criteria for this weird neuropathy, I was able to be a, a co-leader in my first major multicenter investigator initiated study that worked. So actually one of my first trials actually was positive, um, which was nice because um, many times they are not. Uh, and, I, um, and, and I got really to see the value of investigator-initiated studies. And, uh, and, and so that, this was influential in my career. So mentors. So let's show this next clip. Sandofloa. Big sucker. Sandofloa. Sandofloa. Now show me wax on, wax off. Aye. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Hey, wax on, hat. Wax off, hat. Concentrate. Look at my eye. Lock a hand. Thumb inside. Wax on, hat. Wax off, hat. Wax on, hat. Wax off, hat. Wax on. Wax off. This is the best part of this movie. <laughs> Show me paint a fence. Up, down. Up, down. Up, down. Other side. Look, I. Always look, I. 
show me paint the house. Say, say. Lock the wrist. Side, side. Side, side. Yes. Show me wax on, wax off. Yes! 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 Show me paint the fence. Yes! 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 Show me side the side. Yes! 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 Show me sand the floor. Yes! 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 All right, that's it. You can stop the film. <laughs> anyway, I love that. And um, uh, you didn't know you were going to movie night, did you? So, uh, but I, I, every time I see that, it it's really reminds me of what mentorship is really about. All right, so other, other advice, and I'm going to try to run through these last slides uh, faster. Um, I only have one more movie clip. Um, so the uh, right, right, right. I probably told you this, Daniela, when you were a resident. I know I usually tell all the residents who I know want to go into academics, just write everything you can early and often. Um, they're all important. Um, and even your negative data, I'll show you one of those in just a minute. Um, you, uh, I used to say, I used to have this folder of, of first, second, third tier fringe journals that I would always go to when I got rejected at the, the big, big, big journals. Um, and that's still true. The problem is now we have open access journals, which are predatory. And so you really have to be careful. And so for the uh, young doctors in the room that are, uh, don't, don't fall prey to the open access. And that's where your medical school librarian is for. They will tell you if whether or not you should submit to a certain journal or not. Um, this was a, a negative clinical trial. This is my first uh, investigator initiated IIT, IVIG for myasthenia. I don't even know if you know about this, Namita. This was before you got involved. And so uh, I had this idea. I got an R01, uh, and uh, I, I, was, I had like a dozen sites, and we were going. And this is in the 90s. And then there was this massive IVIG shortage in the United States, and it shut the trial down. We tried getting it from other sources, never, never could do it. And so that's fine. So, it was a, so first of all, you write up your negative data. We only entered 15 patients. We were supposed to have 100. Um, but we still wrote it up. And number two, that's when I developed the MGADL and the QMG for this trial. And those have become used now industry in all of our new Mycenae Gravis trials that are still being done. So something good comes out of it. Um, I mentioned open access. Um, if, uh, if you want to see a really cool open access journal, this is the one that I started three years ago. Um, it's a little, I probably should have had a different name. But it's too late now because it's already filed in the Library of Congress. But it's Rick's Real Neuromuscular Friends Neuromuscular Journal. And uh, I found out that there's this software that you can get uh, through a couple companies. But my library at KU had it. Now we have it at MU. And you can start your own journal and get it registered in the Library of Congress. And it's not that hard. Um, and it's in PubMed. I, I'm sorry, it's in Google Scholar. And we're about to be in PubMed. So this comes out, uh, about, I put out about four a year. So you, uh, and, and so why do you need those uh, uh, avenues? You need to get your name out there. You need to be presenting your abstracts at many meetings, more than one a year, uh, and you need to network. So I love this painting. Students, who, who painted this? Anyone? So this is, a, this is in the Vatican. This is Raphael, School of Athens. I just uh, love this uh, painting. So it's, it's, it's real academic networking. And, um, and you can't work in isolation. This is how you get invited to be in pharma trials, academic trials, and, uh, uh, and it's very important to network. And be bold. You know, I actually sent this slide to someone uh, today who I'm trying to recruit to MU. Um, uh, and uh, to, to try to make take the lead. Be bold, be a little bit uncomfortable um, with, with, in your first academic job uh, uh, be, uh, because it's, it's usually that boldness and that intensity that, um, that, that, will, uh, that will make you successful. And I was, I, I don't know, I have, I'm a paper guy, so I have this little daily calendar. And so I was looking at my daily calendar today 
and for February, uh, for, uh, for March, and there's a quote up at the top, they have these quotes to remember, it said, be fearless, have the courage to take risks, go where there are no guarantees. That sounds really profound. Who said that? Katie Couric. So who knew? Yeah, so, <laughs> so that really raised Katie Couric up in my, in my esteem. All right, so uh, you need to network. So the neuromuscular docs in the room will recognize these groups. They don't mean any, anything to any, the rest of you, but you need to find your peeps. You need to find the groups that you are gonna hang out with academically uh, multiple times a year for many years and, uh, and that's, what, that's where you uh, uh, are able to get your teams together and be successful. This is my teams. And one of them is this uh, neuromuscular study group that Namita has been to and, and, Anna, and Annabelle. And um, it's been going on for over 20 years. I've been the head of it for now over a dozen. And here's our group pictures. And then we had Zoom. Uh, we, uh, we had COVID and we had to do it by Zoom. And now we were back last year in Italy. And so I, I find these as sort of the high points of my, of my academic career. So I was listening to NPR uh, an, uh, 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 about a decade ago, and Jimmy Connors was being interviewed. And he said this thing that I thought was very profound as a professional tennis player. And, you know, he, they, they hit their success when they're in their mid and late 20s. And he said, you know, maybe one thing is good enough. And that's just the opposite in medicine. Um, you don't even hit your groove until you're in your 40s. Um, and you actually uh, have to keep thinking of new ideas and stay in the discovery hunt. And so, so being, being in healthcare research is different from being an athlete. And then there are other, uh, uh, today you're getting the advice from Rick Barron, um, but uh, there are many uh, uh, unbelievably successful scientists that, uh, that have written books on career advice. And here's just a few. So uh, medical students, high school students, um, these, these are, most of these are extremely readable books. Claude Bernard wrote the first one in the 1800s that was sort of a, a handbook on how to be successful in research. Um, my favorites are the ones by E.O. Wilson, the ant doctor who, uh, Harvard ant, uh, ant, ant doctor who died last year, I believe. These, his books are amazing. Uh, Ramoni Cajal's Neuropathologist is also a great book. And Walter Cannon, who was an influential researcher in the autonomic nervous system. And then there's this Hans Seeley book that I stumbled on uh, uh, a, a couple years ago because I was doing some uh, research on ACTH and, 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 uh, and cortisol and how, how we understood the whole ACTH and cortisol process. And that, he was a leader in this in the 40s and 50s. And he wrote this book that has, look at the table of contents. It tells you how to do everything. Um, and uh, it's actually a pretty interesting book. And I love this picture of him with his research mouse. Um, it's sort of cute. All right, uh, last, last clip. And this is um, all those things that I've said, all the advice I've given you. Oh, go back. If you don't really want it, you're not going to be successful. So why don't we run this clip? All right, good. Uh, check the generator. Yes, master. Life! Life, do you hear me? Give my creation! All right, so you don't have to be that intense, but you have to want to do it. <laughs> you, have to, you, have to be, you have to have interest, and that's what that's about. So just to wind up, you know, why do we do this? He was trying to create life. So you do this for altruistic reasons. Um, you do it because you want to discover new knowledge. You want to publish. You want to get patents. That's what this building is all about. UCI, 150 patents a year, that's pretty good. Um, you um, want to uh, pursue what you enjoy. You find something you like to do and that you love to do, but you also need a job. This is a way to make money. You can bring money in from, from grants, business. Um, and then there's sort of the, you know, the other end of the, spe it's, uh, of the spectrum. There is an issue of uh, wanting to be recognized, um, uh, fame, 
ego. So you do, you do need to recognize all of these motives as, as you do the research process. And I really talked about the pathways of clinical and laboratory research, but there are many other pathways that you can take as well, data mining, uh, 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 quality improvement outcomes research, and then entrepreneurship, which is what this building is all about. Um, actually get IP on, a, on an idea, um, do a startup or license your idea to a company, um, raise money, um, crowdsource, uh, maybe outsource your research. So I have been thinking about this now for a number of years and that especially in California, which is really the home of this, uh, although it's, it's more in Northern California, perhaps in Stanford and, 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 and UCSF, but uh, in, in, some, in some discovery circles in healthcare, there's less focus on writing, publishing grants in the scientific method. And there's more focus on uh, forming startups, raising venture capital, uh, uh, starting a company, selling the company. Um, and, uh, and, and I don't know how much of that is here at, at UC Irvine. And maybe you can do a blend of both. So uh, Dr. Atul Butte, some of you may know him. He's still, I believe, at UCSF. He was in Kansas City uh, uh, doing a dinner talk uh, a few years ago, and he was just spellbinding. Uh, and at the end of his talk, um, he said that my summary points was that writing papers and grants in his universe isn't that valuable. Um, what's really valuable to him was big data analysis that uh, uh, leading to ideas for biomarkers uh, and, and, and ultimately treatment. So he was telling me that he would go to assaydepot.com and order a strain of mice, tell, tell, and, 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 uh, and get, design the experiment and tell assaydepot.com to do the experiment. I tried to do this once and I, they didn't have the mice I wanted uh, with the gene defect. And, um, and he said, don't write about it, just do it. Do what? Patent startups license, uh, and license to a company. And he was telling us that 50% of his grad students at UCSF had startups. Um, and so I don't know that you have to go this far, but it is the other model. So to end, um, I have this cartoon from Doonesbury, which I really like. And so I think the premise to this is there is this dude who dropped out of college and um, he ended up being unbelievably successful uh, in his entrepreneurship. So he's asked now to come back to give the uh, graduation address to the schoolmates that he started with as a freshman. Uh, and so the, uh, they're telling him to come out. He says, I'm closing a deal, yo. Um, no worries, we'll hold it up. And, uh, and so he says, thanks, guys. How crazy is this, right? Me, a Walden dropout, getting an honorary degree with my original class. And all I did was follow my dream of disrupting an inefficient industry by, <laughs> by creating surge pricing app for mobile sex workers. As you know, it changed the world. Meanwhile... After a four-year slog, here you all sit, minutes away from being credentialed, sheep waiting for your sheepskins. It doesn't have to be this way, people. It's not too late to pivot. If I can do it, you can do it. And then the president comes up behind him and says, Chris, not loving where this is going, son. And I just thought, like, so that's where I'm going to end. So once again, thank you very much for having me come to Irvine. <laughs> And I hope I got some, especially the young people here, a little bit interested in research careers. Any questions? Yeah, oh, yeah, here we got one. Grant rejections. So, oh, okay, so it, it, it's, a, it's a great question. What are the setbacks that I've encountered in my journey in, in my health, in my medical profession? I haven't. Uh, I've had a dream journey. I mean, uh, uh, I, I couldn't have asked for anything better. But what if you're going to go this route and try to do research, be prepared for a lot of rejections. And most of the grants that you submit get rejected um, the first time, the second time, and, and you just don't give up and you keep submitting them. Eventually, sometimes you have to give up, but usually not until you've submitted it three, four times. And then journal rejections, too. Um, so you may not get the articles published where you want it, um, but then you have to go to your second, third, fourth line journals. So if, you know, 
that's really not that bad, is it? You know, if that's all that if that's all that happens to you, it's it's a good life. It's a really good life. Yeah. Oh, good microphones. Are there any hard decisions you've made throughout your career that like stand out to you? Hard decisions that I've made. Well, so I've made some interesting decisions that you would think would not have made me a successful researcher, um, like going to a six-year med school out of high school or joining the military. Um, uh, but, you know, they were, in the big picture, they ended up being great decisions. Um, they made me what I am today. I love my time in the Air Force. And what I learned through that uh, and working with people who took more traditional pathways um, was uh, there are, mul you know, there are just multiple ways to, to success. And um, and so I'm, I'm happy with the pathway that I took, and I think you all just need to figure out and create your own pathway, maybe using some of the advice I've given you right now today. Yes? Uh, what inspired you to join the Air Force, and how did you pursue that with the medical field? That's a great question. So I am a very patriotic guy, and I love being in the Air Force. It was one of the highlights of my life. Um, and then staying, I did nine years active duty, and then I stayed in the Air Force and I did 11 years in the reserves and I retired as Lieutenant Colonel, which is, you know, pretty uh, weird for, you know, suburban kid from St. Louis. Um, that, but, um, but that's not why I joined. I joined because um, I was, I, I have a younger brother and I was in the UMKC med school and my brother who's really smart, he got into Purdue and my father could only afford one college tuition. So I joined the Air Force so that I could get my medical school tuition paid for, and they actually gave me a stipend too. I thought I was the richest guy in the world. Um, so it was, that, that's why I did it, actually. It was for practical reasons, but it, it was a great decision. Yes. Oh, oh, and, and, and it did not hold me back, obviously, from doing what I wanted to do. Um, so with, with, in, with the rest of my career, yes. So this is from my personal experience and experience from friends, but for those a part of underprivileged or underrepresented communities, what resources would you suggest to those groups striving for a career in the medical field? So you, you have to look at the uh, university you're going to when you're making your decision to go to college. Um, it, there, there are colleges that have embedded in their undergraduate program pathways for, for diverse uh, populations that, that are not as fortunate as the majority population. So at, at, um, at University of Missouri, we have these two great pathways for people that want to get into medical school. One is for rural kids, um, and they can actually uh, get accepted into it when they're a sophomore. It's called the Bryant Pathway. I don't know, maybe you guys know about that. Uh, you probably have friends that are in the Bryant. Do any of you guys in the Bryant Pathway or the Paul? I don't think so. But, uh, but that's so a lot of kids from rural, under, uh, underserved, medically underserved communities in Missouri can, that's a pathway to medical school. The other is the PAUSE pathway, which was just developed uh, a few years ago, and that's for uh, 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 minority populations, uh, not rural though, and they, again, it's based on the rural, the rural program, and they can apply for it as a sophomore and they get coached along on, 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 on how to do well in their MCATs, and they have healthcare experiences, and if they hit their MCAT and their GPA scores, they get an automatic admission. So a number of our medical school admissions are automatic for uh, disadvantaged populations. So you need to pick your college carefully to see if they have those programs. Yes. Hi. Um so explaining the healthcare pathway and career, it seems like a very long pathway and career, which is overwhelming. And uh, with your little chart, you said that you are in the stage where you are in the mid late 60s and 70s. So I was wondering, um, moving forward, what are your future plans with wow, your career? Wow, what a career? great question. Um, I, you know, I moved from uh, University of Kansas, um, arch competitor to the state of Missouri. Um, I spent 20 great years in Kansas, and then I got this dream job at the University of Missouri to lead the healthcare system and the medical school. And 
you know, I feel like I've done it. So um, I don't know what my, uh, what my next phase is. Um, I, I have some ideas that I really want to get done at the University of Missouri. I was talking to Dean Stamos about them. We're all sort of working on similar ideas, how to expand medical school class size, how to have different pathways uh, for, for, uh, for, for medical school education that maybe combine engineers in medical school and things like that. Um, I want to uh, expand rural health care access in the center of Missouri because it's very, it's very needed. And I'm sure there, it's needed in rural parts of California as well. And I want to really re increase the research um, level at the University of Missouri, um, both in clinical and, and, and preclinical research. So I've got a lot that I want to do. And, you know, I don't know how long uh, I'll have the privilege of, of doing this, but when you're in jobs like Dr. Dean Stamos's in mind, you know, you, you serve at the, um, at the privilege of the presence of the university. And it's an honor to be in these positions. It's really an honor. So every day that I go to work, I just feel like I'm the luckiest man in the world to be doing this. And uh, I, I've never worried too much on that big table that I wrote um, what I was going to do in that next decade. And that's sort of a retrospective look. So um, I think I'll leave it at that. But good question. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all very much. And thank you to the high school students. You're great. Oh, okay. That was really uh, great, uh, Dr. Barnes. Uh, really appreciate the uh, insightful journey through your pathway. And uh, I found a lot of similarities, actually. So yeah. I'll have to talk some more uh, yeah. maybe tomorrow. But uh, we really appreciate you. Uh, uh, taking us through that journey and, and helping us and especially helping the younger folks in the yeah. audience understand what the opportunities are and realize that there is no one way to get there, is there? Right. That's, that's the key uh, message, I think, is that there's no one way to get there. Lots of options. And ultimately, every time you seek out an option, um, make the most of it, right? That's, and that's what Dr. Barron has done, obviously. Uh, we have a small token of our appreciation. Oh, wow. It's not so it's small. Not so, not so light. Oh, it's, it's not that big, but it's heavy. Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. That's really nice. Thank you. Oh, we've got pictures. So, so let's get a picture for the team here. All right. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And hopefully I'll see some of you tomorrow when I go through some of my clinical research uh, stories. Thank you. I want to thank Marissa Vance and Claire Brainerd Draper uh, for their hard work putting this all together. Thank you both. And all of you here this evening that have made our Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series successful. Our next lecture will take place on May 10th and will feature Dr. Bowden or Bo uh, Pomahawk, uh, the Chief of the Division of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery at Yale New Haven Health and to Frank F. Kanthak, Professor of Surgery at Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Pomahawk is one of the innovators in the facial transplant program in, in the world. He was the first person in the US to do such a transplant and the third one in the world, and actually has quite a wealth of experience now over that period of time, and really providing opportunities for really patients that had you know a pretty dismal um, dismal outcome without that. So it'll be an exciting talk and visit as uh, as he comes here to uh, join us. So please uh, stay tuned, and we'll share more details in the coming months, and then uh, we'll get our next series going for next year. Thank you all very much.